You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Ball. Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk. Except no imitation. I've got to start with the NLCS. The Dodgers looked dead to the world. From the second to seventh innings of that game. I mean, all you have to do is think back to the fourth inning. Austin Riley hits a deep fly ball to center field. Lux doesn't track it well. It hits off his glove. Runners on second and third. One man out. That was really the catalyst for that fourth inning where the Braves put up four runs. Jock Peterson hit an RBI single. Adam Duvall hit an RBI single. Travis Darno walked. Dansby Swanson hit a ball that deflected off Corey Seager's glove. It was scored as a single. But then, something interesting happened. Firstly, Ron Washington held Adam Duvall. I'm thinking as soon as that ball deflects into shallow left field, two runs are going to score. But Washington held Duvall. I don't get it. This is a guy who was insanely aggressive in Game 2. It worked. Corey Seager needs to make a perfect throw there. Realize, he has to run towards that ball in shallow left with his back to home plate. Then, he has to spin and throw a perfect strike to Will Smith. That's an incredibly tough play. You just saw Seager miss a ball that realistically he should have had. The Dodgers' defense in this series has been terrible. How do you not chance it there? You've taken the lean at this point. It's 3 to 2. Make it 4 to 2. Granted, you had the bases loaded and Duval scored anyway. But that level of conservatism plays into The second questionable decision that the Braves made that inning. You've got the bases loaded. One man out. Charlie Morton due up. Morton really wasn't great. He settled down as the game progressed, but... Realize at that point, in the top of the fourth, he would have pitched three innings 
and had given up two runs. He was throwing a lot of pitches. No one would have begrudged you for pulling Morton early. I understand that you don't have a great bench, but A. Ray Adrianza did hit 249 this year. He gives you a great chance of opening the floodgates. A ball in the gap scores two, maybe three. You knock Bueller out of the game. Dodger Stadium is dead at that point. Maybe Adrianza would have made out, but... I think that level of conservatism is important to consider when factoring in why the Braves lost this game. The Washington thing, okay, that didn't matter because Duvall scored anyway. But not pinch hitting for Morton, only having one run score after that? Leaving the bases loaded with Freddie Freeman at bat? Alex Vessia getting him out? That doesn't work for me. I mean, Freeman has really struggled in this series. I understand that he went 3 for 4 yesterday, but before then, he had been 0 for 8. The hits that he was getting weren't really clutch hits. I'm sorry, but you've got the opportunity to knock in a run or two and you get Alex Vessia to get you to fly out? That doesn't work for me. I expect better than that from Freeman. But regardless, it's 5-2 entering the bottom of the eighth. Dodgers fans are trying like crazy to will their team back into this game, but it's not working. Luke Jackson comes on. He's the setup guy to get the ball to Will Smith. You're thinking, okay... Here it comes. Jackson and Smith are going to get six outs. The Braves are going to win this game 5-2. to two. But then the Dodgers pulled off one of the most improbable rallies you'll ever see. Will Smith singles, but then Justin Turner pops out. A.J. Pollock singles. So the tying run is at bat in the form of Cody Bellinger. We all know how bad Bellinger has been this year. He's been hurt. When he's played, he's only hit 165 with 10 home runs and 36 RBIs. In these playoffs, he's actually been good. He's been hitting 286. But no one expected him to hit a home run. The best you could hope for would be like a single or double. Hand the baton over to Chris Taylor. See if he can work some more magic like he did against the Cardinals. No one's thinking that Bellinger is going to have a 2019-esque at bat. But he did. He hit a high fastball from Luke Jackson out of the park. Dodger Stadium erupted. The whole baseball world erupted. If you're not a Red Sox fan or an Astros fan, you were watching that game. As 
as a baseball fan. That was one of the biggest home runs you'll ever see. It may have saved the Dodgers' season. Let's say Bellinger grounds into a double play. And let's say the Dodgers go 1-2-3 in the bottom of the ninth. They're down 3-0. They're not coming back from that. I mean, granted, a 3-1 is still tough, but... A 3-0 is even tougher. That's only been done once in baseball history. And we're not going to talk about what teams took part in that, and we're not going to talk about why it happened. There's just no way that the Dodgers would come back from 3-0 down. 3-1 down? It's a little more reasonable. Still unlikely, but it's a little more reasonable. But even if you're looking at that home run in a bubble, you think about some of the big home runs in baseball history. Jim Leyritz in 96. Bernie Carbo in 75. Mike Sosha in 88. DJ LeMayhew in 2019. Any of the Yankees home runs... In 2001, the Bellinger home run is right up there. Now, granted, the Carbo, LeMayhew, and other Yankees home runs aren't as memorable because Carlton Fisk happened, because Jose Altuve happened, and because Luis Gonzalez happened. But... If the Dodgers rally and win three more games, they don't even need to win the World Series for this to happen. Just win three more games, that Bellinger home run becomes just as important as the Sosha home run and the Lairitz home run. Is it in the Joe Carter... Or Bill Mazeroski tier? No. It's in the tier below. But that's okay. It's okay to be Jim Leyritz. It's okay to be Mike Sosha. It's okay to be Alfonso Soriano. That home run that Cody Bellinger had could very well be the biggest hit that he ever gets in his life. And that's okay. Because if the Dodgers win the pennant, he'll never have to buy another drink for as long as he lives in the city of Los Angeles. Look, there's a lot of baseball left to play. Make no mistake about it. Every game from here on out for the Dodgers is a must-win. You don't want to fall behind 3-1. You don't want to fall behind 3-2 going back to Atlanta. Fantastic job by Bellinger. You can't praise him enough. But here's where the conservatism reared its ugly head again. After giving up two singles and a home run... There's no way that Jackson's going to pitch to Chris Taylor, right? No, he pitched to Chris Taylor, and he gave up a single. Jesse Chavez came in with a runner on first. Taylor stole second, advanced to third on a Matt Beatty ground out. Then Mookie Betts hit an RBI double that made it 6-5 Dodgers. How do you allow Luke Jackson to pitch to Chris Taylor there? It's clear that Jackson had nothing. You cannot let him pitch to Taylor. Chris Taylor is a really good playoff performer. 
You're bringing in Chavez in a dirty inning? With a runner on? No! You bring him in in a clean inning with no one on. Let him get two more outs. And then maybe, just maybe, you get another big ninth inning hit. I was stunned to see Jackson out there after the Bellinger home run. It was almost like the Braves approached this game with a we-don't-need-this mindset. And in all fairness, if they win tonight, it's just as good as being up 3-0. I understand that it's a lot harder to come back and win four straight rather than to come back and win three straight. Okay, believe me, I know. I'm a Yankees fan. But a 3-1 deficit is still insanely tough. Like, I get the logic of playing for game four rather than game three. But realize something. You're going with a bullpen game today. Those, more often than not, don't work in the playoffs. I mean, not for nothing, but your bullpen just got shellacked for four runs in the bottom of the eighth inning yesterday. Now you're expecting it to get 27 outs? How does that make any sense? What are the Braves doing? They have this golden opportunity to put a stranglehold on this series. And they're blowing it. Not for nothing, but Tyler Matzek almost blew the game in the seventh inning in game two. The idea that this is some lockdown bullpen that's going to get 27 outs is nonsense. Huh, who's going to win this game? The Braves bullpen or the 20-game winner in Julio Urias? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. i got to put my thinking cap on for that one. You know, the Braves haven't even announced who's going to start. We know it's going to be a bullpen game. We don't know who's going to start. The Dodgers are going to win this game. It's going to be down to a best two out of three. Look, you'll still have home field advantage. And if you win game five, you've got to feel really good about your chances to win at least one of the two games in Atlanta. But playing it conservative yesterday didn't work. You were aggressive in game two, and it worked. Now you're going with a bullpen game in game four? I'm telling you, it seemed like that's what the Braves were doing. They were playing for game four. We don't need this one. We're just going to look to game four. That's the only way that being conservative makes any sense. But it's not going to work. The Dodgers have a pulse right now. And it's going to get a lot stronger when they win tonight. There's no way that the Dodgers are going to lose this game. When the Braves are going with a bullpen game. The NLCS will be down to a best two out of three. Moving on now to the ALCS, Astros Red Sox. And this was an epic choke job by the Red Sox. I mean, I've seen the Red Sox choke plenty of games in my life. This one's right up there. You have the opportunity to put a stranglehold on this series, go up 3-1, and you blow it? What got in the water supply yesterday? You've got the Braves making stupid decisions. You've got the Red Sox blowing a game that was right there for the taking. I just don't get it. You knock Zach Granke out after only 37 pitches, after he only gets four outs. So the Astros' bullpen has to get 23 outs. This 
is a taxed Astros bullpen. They had to pitch a lot in game two, and they had to pitch a lot in game three. The fact that Brooks Raley, Christian Javier, Phil Meaton, Kendall Graveman, and Ryan Presley were able to shut out the Red Sox defies all logic. I mean, the Red Sox had their chances, first and second, one man out, in the bottom of the second, Kike Hernandez and Rafael Devers make out, bottom of the fourth, runner on third, one man out, Kyle Schwarber and Kike Hernandez make out, bottom of the fifth, runner on second, one man out, Alex Verdugo and J.D. Martinez make out. Bottom of the sixth. You get a leadoff walk. You fail to advance him. The Red Sox had golden opportunities to blow the Astros out. They just couldn't convert. Everyone's talking about that missed third strike by Laz Diaz. And I'll get into that in a second. But it never should have come down to that. The Red Sox left 11 guys on base. They did nothing with runners in scoring position. The Red Sox had their chances. They failed. Before I get into the unmitigated failure that was Laz Diaz, I want to talk about the Red Sox's pitching decisions. Because that's the thing. Everyone's focusing on Diaz. You're focusing on the wrong things. Focus on the fact that the Red Sox couldn't hit the Astros' bullpen and the fact that Alex Cora mismanaged that game. You can't pull Nick Pavetta after five innings. Not the way he was pitching. Not after only giving up two hits through five innings and having only thrown 65 pitches. You let him start the sixth. You ride that train for as long as possible. You don't say after five innings, that's it. That's the max. That doesn't work. You bring in Josh Taylor. He gives up a two-out single to Jordan Alvarez. And you pull him? You burn Adivino for one batter? I don't get it. You bring in Garrett Whitlock. That's fine. Why did you send him out for a second inning? Why wasn't Robles in there? Why wasn't Brazier in there? How can you send in Whitlock for a second inning? I mean, the reason it happened was because you didn't have Adovino. But you should have had Adovino. Let Pavetta pitch the sixth. Let Pavetta and Taylor get through the sixth. Then, Adovino pitches the 7th, Whitlock pitches the 8th, Brazier pitches the ninth. bada bing, bada boom, you're done. Instead, because you mismanaged the game earlier, you have to ride with Whitlock through the 8th inning, and he gives up the game-tying home run to Jose Altuve. Freaking Altuve. One of the best playoff performers in baseball history. Seriously, all the big moments? It's incredible. But now on to the missed third strike. It's a 1-2 count on Jason Castro. The Astros have runners on first and second, two men out. If Nathan Eovaldi gets Castro out... It's a tie game entering the bottom of the ninth. Eovaldi throws a pitch that any way you slice it is a strike. Okay, I'm a Yankees fan. It's a strike. It wasn't too high. It caught plenty of the plate. It's a strike. 
Laz Diaz calls it a ball. Two pitches later, Castro hits an RBI single. Jose Altuve walks. Martin Perez comes in. Perez allows the floodgates to open. Michael Brantley hits a three RBI double, which really puts the game out of reach. Jordan Alvarez, Carlos Correa, and Kyle Tucker pile on. By the time the bottom of the ninth hits, the Astros are up 9-2. Here's the thing, though. I'm not even upset with Laz Diaz. Because Laz Diaz did what Laz Diaz does. He got the call wrong. You know he's going to get the call wrong. According to umpscorecards.com, Laz Diaz was the fourth worst umpire in the majors this year, behind only Ed Hickox, Brian O'Nora, and Ron Culpa. Here's my question. How on God's green earth does Major League Baseball look at Laz Diaz, one of the most universally despised umpires in the sport by players, by managers, and by fans, and say this guy should be umpiring playoff games? We have the ability to measure how good these umpires are. The only thing that they do now is call balls and strikes. If the goal is to get the call right, why are we allowing mediocre umpires to umpire the most important games of the season. The NFL is merit-based in the playoffs. The NHL basically throws out the rule book in the playoffs. It has to be pretty blatant to be called. How can anyone look at Laz Diaz and say that this guy deserves to be an umpire in the playoffs? Diaz missed A total of 21 calls. That is the most by any umpire in the playoffs. According to umpscorecards.com. Any way you slice it, this guy is one of the worst umpires in the sport. But we're going to let him be an umpire In the most important games of the season? Like, you know that Diaz is going to get calls wrong. So, you can't get upset at him. It's almost lazy, in a way. Think about it this way. Let's say Diaz got that call right. And Jason Castro had struck out. Would we be killing Jason Castro right now? No, because Jason Castro isn't that good. You're not expecting Jason Castro to do anything there. You want him to, but if he doesn't, okay, it was always kind of a long shot. You don't get upset at bad players when they don't execute. So you can't get upset at a bad umpire for not executing. You know that he's bad. So don't get upset at him. Get upset at Major League Baseball for assigning this guy to the postseason. I mean, there are always going to be bad umpires in the regular season. Unless we go to the robo-umpires, which I really don't want. I like the human element. But in the postseason, if we have the data to know 
who the best umpires are. Why wouldn't we use that? Realistically, you only need 24 total umpires. I understand that you may need some substitutes in case something happens. You may need someone for replays. But for the most part, you need 24 umpires. And I can rattle through the 24 guys very easily. I'm not going to do it because it would be incredibly boring. But I promise you I could do it. I'm staring at the list right now. It's very easy to find. If an idiot like me can figure out the best umpires in the sport, why does Major League Baseball constantly send these below-average umpires to umpire the most important games of the year? Laz Diaz was terrible. He never should have been there. Jerry Meals was terrible. He never should have been there. Believe it or not, Gabe Morales, a guy who we killed for Game 5, Dodgers Giants, he actually calls balls and strikes pretty well. Granted, this only takes into account what he did as a home plate umpire, not a first or third base umpire. But that's kind of interesting that Morales grades out as one of the best balls and strikes callers in the game. Hey, the numbers don't lie. I mean, not for nothing, that game against the Red Sox where Morales was terrible according to everyone with a Yankees affiliation was actually his third best game of the season. He called balls and strikes with a 97.7% accuracy, according to umpscorecards.com. So, hey, give Morales credit. He's Jocko Conlon compared to Laz Diaz. He's Nestor Shylack compared to Jerry Meals. There are always going to be missed calls. The goal should be to minimize them by putting the best people out there possible. Major League Baseball does not do that. We have the data to determine who the best umpires are. Let's use it to our advantage. But now it's time to preview tonight's game. Between the Astros and Red Sox, the all-important Game 5. It'll be Framber Valdez going up against Chris Sale. This is a rematch of Game 1. Both starters were ineffective. Neither one went three innings. You gotta think they'll be better, right? I mean, Valdez is a solid pitcher. Not great, but not terrible. He went 11-6 and six with a 3-1-4 ERA this year. He relies on deception. Sinker, curveball, changeup. If he can bury those pitches, he can force ground balls, and he can force soft contact. If he leaves them hanging, that's when he gets into trouble. The key with Valdez is to hit his mistakes. That's easier said than done. Because his mistakes look a lot like his really good pitches. That's what happens when you're dealing with an off-speed pitcher. He'll throw a pitch that looks great, and then at the last second, it just dies. But if it doesn't die, you can hit it out of the park, but if you don't realize it in time, you foul it away, or you don't make contact at all. Very tough to hit off-speed pitchers if they're doing it right. If they're not, 
It's incredibly easy, but if they are, and Valdez does more often than not, they're very tough. Now, Chris Sale is like the polar opposite. Fastball slider changeup. Loves to overpower you with the fastball. Throws a strong changeup. He has a slider with great break. It's not fast at all, but it just dies on hitters. And his changeup makes righties look like they need a bow door to hit it. When Sale is on, he's one of the best pitchers in baseball. But in these playoffs, he has been really bad. Like I said, he did not pitch well in Game 1. In Game 2 of the ALDS against the Rays, he only pitched one inning. He gave up five runs. The last game of the season against the Nationals, a game that the Red Sox needed to win if they wanted home field advantage in the wild card game, Sale only pitched two and a third. Sale needs to start pitching like Sale. All right, this is a really important game for the Red Sox. You don't want to be down 3-2, needing to win two games in Houston. You should win this game. You have the better pitcher. If you don't win it, The Astros are going to win this series, but I picked the Red Sox in this series, so I kind of have to say that Boston's going to win. All right, now I'll give you some NBA vault talk, and I'll start by breaking down Nets Bucks. The Nets look really bad. I mean, it's weird. They shot the ball well. 44% from the field, 53% from beyond the arc. But they gave up 127 points. I mean, my God. Pat Connaughton drops 20. Jordan Wara drops 15. You know that Giannis is going to get his. You know that Middleton is going to get his. But the Nets just look dead to the world. They couldn't rebound. Nick Claxton looked dreadful. He was a turnstile. The supposed defensive stoppers on the Nets did nothing. James Johnson in 20 minutes didn't do anything. Javon Carter in 18 minutes didn't do anything. Paul Millsap barely played. I understand it's the first game of the season. You're still figuring out rotations, but Paul Millsap can't play just 5 minutes. James Johnson can't play 20 minutes. Javon Carter can't play 18 minutes. That was a really tough game to watch. I mean, I'm a Nets fan. You know that. I was really excited about that game. I was watching that game over Red Sox-Astros. I hate the Red Sox and Astros. Let me watch the Nets start the NBA season. The 75th year of the league. Let's go. This is going to be a great game. I mean, the Nets should win it. The Bucks were shorthanded. No DiVincenzo, no Portis, no Hood, no Ojale. I understand that the Nets had no Kyrie, but that's something that they're going to have to deal with. The absence of Kyrie wasn't the reason why the Nets lost this game. It's something that's going to be a question... Would Kyrie have made a difference? It's something that's going to be asked all year after the Nets lose, but he wouldn't have made a difference here. 
Especially because Patty Mills was probably the second or third best player on the floor for Brooklyn. I mean, he shot seven for seven from beyond the arc. It doesn't get much better than that. He was the guy that kept the Nets in this game. The Nets were down by as much as 19 in the first quarter. You're thinking, okay, the route is on. But the Nets were only down by 7 at the half. Mills had 15 points in the first half. He was great. I mean, I don't want to read too much into just one game. The Bucks were highly motivated. Fans in the stands. They're getting their rings. They're putting the banner up in the rafters. That was a spirited performance by the Bucks. They looked outstanding. I'm not screaming doom and gloom. I promise you that. It's hard to read a lot into just one game. Especially the first game of the season. Moving on now to Warriors-Lakers. A very surprising win for Golden State. They looked absolutely incredible. Six players scored at least 12 points. Andrew Wiggins had 12. Andre Iguodala had 12. Nemanja Bialica had 15. He had a double-double off the bench. Damian Lee had 15. Jordan Poole had 20. And Steph Curry had his first triple-double since 2016. I mean, one thing that we learned from the Lakers last year is that LeBron and AD can't do it all by themselves. That's why they were so aggressive this offseason. Trading for Westbrook. Bringing in DeAndre Jordan. Bringing in Melo. Bringing back Rondo. Bringing back Dwight Howard. Bringing in Malik Monk. Bringing in Avery Bradley. But only two Lakers, LeBron and AD, had more than nine points. It was a really bad performance by the Lakers. They really didn't shoot the ball well. They hit just 36% of their three-point tries. They missed 10 of their 19 free throws. They got out-rebounded. Basketball's a team sport. It doesn't matter if you have two guys... Dropping over 30, which is what LeBron and AD did. LeBron dropped 34, AD dropped 33. They both had double-doubles. If you have six guys scoring at least 12 points, three of whom are coming off the bench, yeah, you've got a great chance of winning. Really impressive performance by the Warriors. Tough loss for the Lakers. I'm not going to go too crazy about it. Again, it's just one game. I think we all know they're going to be fine. Russell Westbrook was clearly the third option, though. And he struggled in that role. He shot 4 for 13 from the field, 0 for 4 from beyond the arc. He had 8 points, 5 rebounds, and 4 assists in 35 minutes. I'm going to be very interested in how Westbrook plays this year. Because him and LeBron may kill each other. I said that when the trade happened. And I'll say it all throughout the year. It's one of the biggest storylines to monitor in the NBA. How Westbrook meshes with the Lakers. I'll close this show out by breaking down Jonas Valanciunas' extension. 
He signed a two-year extension with the Pelicans worth $30.1 million. And this is an interesting move, locking up Valanchunas before he ever plays a game for the Pelicans. I mean, this is really risky. A, Valanchunas has an injury history, but B, he may not work with the Pelicans. Like, what was the biggest issue that the Pelicans had last year? Lack of spacing. Steven Adams and Zion did not work. So you bring in Valanchunas, who's a better player, seems to be learning how to shoot it from beyond the arc. Last year for the Grizzlies, he hit 21 of his 57 three-point tries. That's a 36.8 three-point percentage. Maybe he'll never become Brooke Lopez, but I don't think he'll stay as Andre Drummond when it comes to outside shooting. This can work. It's really risky, though. To double down on Valanchunas like this is a risk that I really can't get behind. I'll say this, though. It's a very tradable contract. I'll take Valanchunas on my team at a little over 15 mil per year. That's more than fair for him. I'm just not sure how he's going to fit with the Pelicans. This can work. It's just a risky bet to double down on him. I'm not sure I would do it if I was David Griffin. Until tomorrow, I'm Jacob Volk. And always remember, if you disagree with me, you're wrong.